Space. Щастлива съм за това, защото събития като днешното са един съобразен think tank на общността на Балканската общност, за колкото разбирам. I'm happy that an event like this is something like a think tank for the, for the Balkan community. Едно събитие създаващо нови възможности за сътрудничество, за невероятен обмен на опит. An event that creates the opportunity to share experience and ideas. Всеки един от вас ще получи приветствието от Министерството на економиката, което сме подготвили. Every single one of you will receive the um, the address. The address from the Ministry of Economy. Извинявам, министър Кранеков, който днес председателства формалния съвет по конкурентоспособност в Брюксел. I need to excuse the minister as he is chairing the the I'm sorry. Формалния съвет. The formal council for competitiveness in Brussels. Но това, което се случва днес, дава нови надежди. But what is happening right now gives a new hope. Да продължат да се изграждат специфични политики в Министерство на економиката. That there will be future development of specific politics in the Ministry of Economy. За подкрепа на българската стартъп общност. For the support of the Bulgarian startup community. Сигурна съм, че във всяка страна, всяка ваша страна на вас, представителите в днешното събитие. I'm sure that uh, from every, every country that took place in this event. Също има разписани политики за подкрепа и амбиции в това отношение. There are also written policies for support in this area. Щастлива съм да мога да ви кажа, че тук в България създадохме българска стартъп асоциация. I'm happy to share that here in Bulgaria we created a Bulgarian Startup Association. Чието представители бяха тук сред вас. Това е Добромир Иванов. Whose members were among you? Here is Dobromir Ivanov. Also, MoveBG and EditBG are part of it, also ABLE. И да кажа нещо, което до сега не е анонсирано, вероятно ще има още едно събитие подобно на днешното. And also to share something with you that hasn't been announced, there's going to be an event like this one. Тук в София. Also here in Sofia. Което отново ще покани вас, вашите колеги и хората, decision makers в балканските страни. That will also invite all of you colleagues and decision makers in the Balkan states. Да се подкрепят в общото усилие за дигитално въздигане на Балканите. To support each other in order to develop the Balkans digitally. И за изграждане на една взаимно подкрепяща сте стартъп екосистема на Балканския регион. And for the creation of a supportive ecosystem in the Balkans. Още веднъж благодаря на организаторите на MoveBG, Фундация Hans Eidel, Българския център за жени в технологиите, мрежата Edit, Института за економическа политика и на всички, които в днешния страхотен слънчев ден. Once again, I want to thank all the organizers and every single one of you who joined in this sunny day. Решиха да отделят времето си, за да обменят своята страст and decided to spend their time just sharing their passion for the digital development of our Balkan states. I wish the conference a success and for, uh, for uh, the future development of the, all the decisions that have been made. And once again, thank you. А сега искам да поканя Дени, която е репортьор на първата група, която работеше за стартъп екосистемата. Hello everyone, my name is Denita. To the ones that I haven't met yet, I'm the CEO of the Association of the Bulgarian Leaders and Entrepreneurs, or ABO. Uh, I had the pleasure to work today with uh, uh, quite a big international group of uh, very active people from all around Europe and to discuss the startup ecosystem 
mainly on the Balkans. Um, I really would like to thank also to our moderator, Nick, who helped us today to really uh, discuss all the important issues, but also to come up with some concrete <laughs> ideas and to um, create a common vision within our team. So uh, today our group started uh, with um, basically discussing the problems in Bulgaria, afterwards continuing with uh, the Balkan region and also seeing the context of the European level. And what is the main takeaway for myself actually was that these problems are pretty much the same everywhere. Uh, we just need to work together to address them and that's what will make it easier. And we all agreed that the Balkan region is quite fragmented in terms of um, know-how and in terms of networks. We all have our success stories, our networks with other countries, but we don't have something uh, common for the whole region. Um, so this was kind of the main, main problem that we addressed, of course, uh, behind me uh, and further down, if the colleagues scroll, you would be able to see all the other issues that we discussed but did not point out as uh, main issues. We also agreed that the um, knowledge sharing should be systematized. What does this mean? There are plenty of platforms, plenty of events, but yet not really one place where the knowledge uh, could be aggregated. And another very important topic uh, that we discussed was that we don't have a regional branding. Basically, if we um, unite powers and uh, make a common branding for the region, this could attract investors, this could attract uh, further collaborations for our region. So then after discussing the main issues, we uh, continued with the focus. So we're, what could we achieve in this group of 17 that we were today so that we can basically have some real impact after we leave uh, today from, from this lovely hotel. So uh, we agreed that uh, we could focus on making the Balkans much more accessible in terms of um, testing products. I think this is some, somewhere further beneath, uh, actually on the very last page. Uh, we also saw that we need stronger interconnections and uh, also building a community. And uh, then we split uh, up ourselves to get some um, different ideas on how could we achieve that. I will say the three main steps that we agreed and that are quite general. And they are basically after the conference to get ourselves on a common platform, for example, LinkedIn or Facebook or um, some other online channel where we could uh, really take it to the next step, take these discussions of two hours to a next level. Then as a second step, find a way to formalize a mission for a common mission for the region um, to agree upon what we could do as a pan association supporting the Balkans. And third step, to, um, to find and to discover events that are significant for the region, that are already existing, where we could communicate this mission. And as a given example, we have the She Leader Conference that is organized under the patronage of the European um, uh, Council in Bulgaria, and we would be able then to already address this issue and, for example, further on in the year at other important events, not only in Bulgaria, of course. So just to mention a few other details that we discussed and that could solve the issues that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we agreed that an online platform is needed where all the resources um, um, of the ecosystem could be shared. We already gave uh, examples of different uh, platforms that already exist on national levels that could be um, in the future extended and uh, made regional. Uh, we also agreed that um, there should be a big regional event where we uh, talk on the important topics, but we also need the small events, road shows and other other type of um, local, uh, local events where we could really uh, discuss the problems that we have. And last but not least, um, yeah, mapping of uh, players of the Balkans, this was many times mentioned and also in the context of <coughs> making a block or, or a media where the problems and the challenges and the good practices could be shared. So uh, very uh, shortly, this was what we came up with. We would very much uh, like to uh, get your ideas as well. So uh, we will meet up on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn later on when we get the, uh, the group created. And um, yeah, thanks for your attention.
Hello, everyone. Here is the paper-based group coming in this digital world. <laughs> I'm Olga Mineva. I'm an organizational consultant. Happy to be uh, one of the presenters of the second group today. So our group was about women in ICT. And we, together with Eva, we had the honor to moderate this group. And we were thinking, what can we do to make a large group of women solve problems in a very effective way? And we found a way to do this very scientific method called the Balkans Coffee. So solving problems, solving, solving problems around the coffee table is a superpower that everybody owns. Thank you. So this um, was a carefully facilitated coffee where we had three tables, three key subtopics or subproblems and three wonderful groups hosted by their hosts on every table. So each group tackled different sub-problem in the topic of women in ICT. We had the girls in ICT, so how do we open the door at an early stage to involve more girls in this sector? Women, how do we keep the spark in the fire going when the girl is already a woman, a mother, and you will hear more about that, and policy level. So what do we do with the environment around these girls and women to encourage them to stay in this field? And as we heard today in the morning, that's not this field, it's everywhere around us. So three groups who talked about transformation and then they rotated so that all the solutions that you're going to hear today are actually the fruits of the great expertise of these women in our group. And you will hear the solutions directly presented by the hosts of every coffee table and their lovely clients in the coffee, or guests, let's say. So firstly, I'm giving the floor to Jana, and she will talk about the role of growth mindset and how do we light the spark at the very early stage, supported by Sylvia. Thank you very much. My name is Jana. I am a coordinator at BCWT. And uh, I was the host at the group uh, discussing problems with the girls in ICT and entrepreneurship. Uh, so have, we have mapped several problems. Um, mainly, uh, first thing is that introduction to ICT and the uh, project of entrepreneurship is uh, happening at a really late stage. Uh, mostly uh, by uh, probably at uh, the last year in high school or even worse during university. Uh, so we have uh, applied uh, one practice uh, which is already happening in Romania and our partners there are doing it and um, our colleague here is going to tell you about it. Uh, also, uh, another problem that we have noted is uh, the mindset that is already created uh, for for the failure uh, to be not to not be accepted as uh, some stage of the development of a idea and the project. Um, another thing is that uh, ICT uh, is present in every profession, and it's not uh, it's a perception that uh, if one has to do a, a project a, a career in ICT, it has to do with coding and uh, development of uh, applications and platforms, and it's not like this. Uh, ICT is in every profession. Uh, it is in marketing, it is in uh, logistics, and in every, every industry. So uh, there should be a change in the perception of uh, technology integration in the whole business process. Um, furthermore, uh, we need to change those stereotypes. Uh, we have mapped several, which uh, I really don't like to share, but they are there. So I'm going to tell you a few of them, like uh, this is not womenly, or uh, this is uh, on women raise children, and so on so far. Uh, there are probably uh, like initiatives uh, for role modeling, uh, for showing uh, good practices and examples of uh, uh, women who have su succeeded to uh, achieve this work balance, uh, work-life balance. Um, and uh, another problem that we have noted 
is uh, the budget allocation to the education system. It was present in, in uh, all the countries that uh, we had uh, pre presenters uh, in our group. Um, we have uh, applied for several uh, solutions as well. Uh, I am giving the word now to my colleague here, who will tell you about the practice of code dojo. Code dojo. Hello. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the solutions we, we found to, to the problems Jana mentioned, but I'm going to go to um, tell you about two initiatives that are happening in Timisoara, Romania, that are actually a solution to two of the problems Jana listed. The first one is the Kotor Dosho Initiative, which is actually a program that helps kid from, uh, kids from the age 7 to, to 17 to get an insight of what the ITC world means and what are the, the opportunities it can offer. And uh, this will solve the, the main problem because kids are finding about technology at a young age, at seven years, not at uh, the end of high school or uh, in university. And uh, the second solution would be the one about failure. And we, in Timișoara, we organize an event called Fuck Up Nights. <laughs> which, uh, which is not an event, we, it's not a, I don't know, a concept that we, we invented, it's a, an event that is happening worldwide. And um, the purpose of it is to have uh, entrepreneurs and uh, startup owners that come and share their success, but also their failure. And by doing this, I think, um, if we would organize this kind of events strictly dedicated to kids, I think they will uh, try to embrace the, the idea of failure as part of the process, as not, and not like, oh my god, it's such a bad thing that I failed and the project is not working. So, these are just a few. And uh, I would like to add one of the solutions as well, because we think that it is one of the most appropriate, because uh, all of these activities, they are present there now, but they need to be focused. Uh, th there are platforms and initiatives for engaging kids in this uh, digital area, but uh, they are not. Uh, they are not so accessible to them. Uh, and uh, we think that uh, we should probably target parents and teachers and uh, elderly at all, uh, in order to. Uh, we can, like, for example, uh, have the idea of making like courses for com uh, combined training, uh, both for children and uh, their parents, and reaching out to the stu to the students uh, and the teachers as an, the, the the school as an uh, institution to help us. But and uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. I'm giving now the word. Okay, to the second group. <laughs> so, thank you. We actually every every sub team has um, concrete steps that we are also going to summarize. But just not to not to lose time, we're now going to present just some of the concrete solutions. So the next team or the next subgroup was about women in ICT. And I will be, will be inviting Eva Matasic to the floor now with the summar summary about uh, the ICT mama or the ICT lady. Yeah. Thank you. So in the meantime, we decided to have the board because we think it's easier. Okay. So you don't need to keep the paper. Uh, to make it simple, and uh, in the end of the day, uh, so we started with mama and we finished with the lady. <laughs> what is the reason? Because uh, if you are in ICT, it doesn't mean necessary that you are mama. And uh, so uh, what we started to discuss is what is the problem and what is the reason why so many women entrepreneurs decide not to be in IT, but they usually choose some other uh, topics and um, professionals 
And uh, then we uh, find the first line, it's about uh, ICT training, but also with the work-life balance education. We find it very important, not only in the stage when already um, women entrepreneurs uh, are mamas or having their established their families, but uh, after the university, during the university, in every segment of their lives that they have these trainings about work-life balance. So uh, problem is definitely that uh, Balkan ICT women usually, there are not a lot of us. Can you please raise the hand who can say that, oppa, is going down, I need the help of, yes, Balkan ICT, not mama, but lady, because all of us, okay, one, two, three, less than 10, okay. Uh, what is second uh, then uh, solution is to make this cooperation between us in the region because we want to be under one roof. We want to be branded as one, that we are the one region that we really present ourselves as one brand, what already was mentioned from the first startup regional group. And for that, uh, we definitely need the money, what means that we need a budget, we need to be very clear what we want in one paper, what is a problem, what is solution and what are the goals, and then see are there any existing projects where we can involve in these activities. So in our group we found uh, two solutions, one is of the colleague Silvia from Macedonia, that, sorry Valentina. <laughs> I apologize, we are first day meeting each other, so I apologize. Uh, so there is a project that is regional, connected to activities, how to support women entrepreneurs. On the other side, uh, I'm also having one project that is already uh, established about gender for STEM, how to establish much more women in IT. So we already have concrete uh, projects that we will just put under the roof of Balkan ICT lady. What we were missing, it's a little bit more, at least one or two men in the group. So because of that, here we have Balkan ICT lady, but our conclusion is that on social media, we will have Balkan social media group, where we also want men to be involved because we need the balance, because in some segment it's needed in the thinking of uh, the mindset. Uh, then uh, why is here good ferry? Uh, because in uh, every situation, if you need support, you need to delegate the things and to make a good result, delegation is the number one, especially because of all activities we are having every day. And then it's a little bit maybe strong, bring them back. But the idea is that uh, all uh, ladies who finished universities for IT are usually not finishing the careers in IT. So to connect with alumni of the universities and integrate them again in this uh, IT profession. So this is one of the ideas. Uh, to make it happen, we definitely, after the money, need lobbying. Each of us has a good connection in the region, what means that we can very easily establish uh, this law. Do you want to comment something? Ladies? Sorry. Do you want to comment something? No, 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 it's okay. okay, if you want, you can just jump in. <laughs> okay, good. Then we are having delegation in uh, action. Fantastic. And uh, the main thing what we find out is that we need one ecosystem because uh, everybody are doing something, so <laughs> let's put it under one roof. Uh, role models we need uh, definitely for establishing these ideas. Uh, there was one uh, good example of a mentorship, but uh, speed mentorship also is idea that we have organization of the events where you don't have mentor that is for free or more months, but just for the event, solving your uh, problems and uh, making solutions. Uh, many times when we are mentoring startups, we find the situation that even if we can't mentor uh, startups and uh, in this case women entrepreneurs, uh, they are making uh, self-helping groups. This is what we want to establish, you know, just make impact and uh, replicate it again and again because we can't always be nearby, but make an organic grow of the idea. Uh, to make this organic grow, first thing is to make social media group uh, that uh, we have community that is interested in the topic. And uh, after that, uh, organize hackathon for these ladies in every country for two days where they will gather, where they will communicate, where they will have mentorships and all other things connected to that. 
And uh, this stay connected means that uh, we are not only targeting the communication to the ladies that are now in ICT, but also the ladies, for example, that are for three years not active in their business, but they can uh, inform themselves and at the moment when they want to involve just connect to initiative. And in the end, uh, we definitely feel that uh, this can happen. We will work on this. And from my side, the commitment is that uh, for this Gender for STEM project, I will do my best to inform you all. And I really want that we keep in touch and stay in communication. Thank you. So, and then the last subgroup. Thank you so much. It's, it was about policy, as I told you, about the environment that is around these women in ICT, around us. And it's super power hosts and, it, and the, all the people that went in this group, they managed to tackle policy problems on levels from parenting to media, employers. So it was really broad, but they really reached some concrete solutions. And I would like to invite Maria Elizabeth Rusling on the floor to present this to you. She's together with Nelly Kalcheva, also representing the ICT. So I can add, uh, like my predecessor, that it was a women-only group. And I'm sure it has been a bias in, in our discussion, but I hope a good one. Um, and another point I wanted to make is for my first time in Sofia, I was very proud to host a Balkan coffee table. <laughs> and uh, we, we had tremendous uh, fun and so much energy around this table. It's, uh, I'm going to try to put that uh, together. So looking at policy and how we can feed into policy recommendations, um, looking at issues raised by women in ICT or the lack of. Um, the first important thing is that we considered um, that women in ICT and the problem is only crystallizing all sorts of other issues that we find in women in the workplace. And that's very important to bear in mind and we understand why. First, looking at the state of play in terms of policy, policy makers, activities and all the programs that have uh, been designed over many, many decades already, and we just heard how in this country uh, the startup uh, policies are, are still a very hot issue. So this is all good. There's a real track record at EU level in, in many countries and all around the world. Sometimes this policy has been about uh, controversy because of quotas, Oops. And, but the quotas have made things change in the boardroom. What we notice is that it didn't change uh, how decisions would be made in the workplace because these quotas have not been applied or even made uh, uh, an obligation uh, at the level of a, a de a decision making body in a company. So when we talk policy, we want to, to also state that private companies are at the core of it. And there is a limit to what government can do and there is a big, um, uh, an important element of the equation is obviously the role of the private sector and the role of the employer themselves. And here I want to add some points that have been made by you know, a second <laughs> deliberation that it is in the interest of the employer themselves to actually look very carefully how they can grow their workforce, grow their company and stimulate you know, more a mixity in their team, whether it's ethnic uh, mixity, gender mixity. And again, so ICT, women in ICT is only one element of, of the reflection. So, Limits of policy for sure, but also policymakers should be encouraged. We can see that coming as, as an initial conclusion very quickly. Policymakers should be encouraged to actually work with employers. So, this is where we want to talk about inclusive policies, and the way of making policy on this issue is crucial. It's about engaging, it's about building from the existing, from um, the right partners from the movers and shakers, the movers and shapers in all these different communities. So how you work with the stakeholders, with the civil society is, uh, an, seems obvious, but it has to be reminded that so much is already happening on the ground and this Balkan dimension uh, can give a lot of uh, different angles to um, building the right policy. 
the issues um, that we, we discuss in connection with women in ICT is something that we all know of, read about, the lack of role model, the problem of image, the time it will take to change anything because we're touching on very soft components on mindsets. So policymakers have to be aware of that. How can we accelerate things? How can we make things a bit more urgent? And there come the uh, idea that perhaps at a uh, Balkan uh, level, a pilot um, program could be, could be built to actually quickly look into that because it will, it will take generations. We also know if we look for inspirations from the EU level, that the EU comes across the national competencies, which is a good thing. You can exercise peer pressure by showing all sorts of good examples, but ultimately it's a national decision maker that makes a national legislation. So both have to work together and the EU is uh, with competitiveness, uh, council, etc., bringing people together and this is an important thing. So EU level, national level, and the stakeholders nationally, regionally, to build on acceptability, because whatever needs to be changed also has to be uh, accepted, whether by uh, the companies, uh, by the society itself. So all solutions, because they are um, societal, because they, they're touching on society, means we're working on education type of policy. Um, but an important point that was made is that Prior to any policy making, actually, you need so much more recognition for the positive role that women could play that we recommend a big campaign. So PR should precede policy. PR is a, would be about storytelling, um, about convincing employers of the importance of engaging on this path. Being careful, perhaps, not to, for them to go too much in the extreme, like perhaps only men should be recruited for a while, so we recuperate <laughs> a good number and balance out. So, um, balancing. So, much broader than just playing on, on um, trying to change the number of women in ICT education. And interesting additional suggestions came at that time that beyond what the government can do in, on education, um, certainly in the field of education itself, in the school by putting together career advisors in the schools to work with girls and engage the kids as well to consider different paths. Um, also the parents have their, their, their role to play, obviously in what they teach to their own and, and trans transfer to their own kids, but also perhaps by helping to build communities between students, between kids, so that the good stories actually evolve in other circles, not just top down or from one generation to the next, but also empowering the kids themselves, so the girls we spoke about, or the women, to play their role and perhaps accelerate then um, these uh, educational changes. Um, so, key thing would be to have urgently some form of pilot, provided this pilot for sure includes and involves uh, the stakeholders at regional level. Um, startup environment, positive uh, stimulation to have more startup and women starting their startups themselves should not be forgotten. You know, it, it seems obvious, but unless women empower themselves, uh, by playing their role and adding value and showing they can add value, the rest will not you know, help very much. So building the right female entrepreneurship environment is a, an important element to uh, make sure that whatever policy would be made uh, in terms of e inclusion, more, uh, inclu including more women in ICT, has to go hand in hand with this type of broader policies. And I mentioned education, and it's important to bear in mind that it's also about educating men and women themselves to give you know, women the confidence to actually play, play the role. And I kept this for the conclusion because I asked then everyone coming to my table, what would be the one thing that you would recommend that should be done absolutely, you know, apart from all these kind of building blocks, and it's very simple. It's about flexibility in the workplace. 
it's not just you know how you play on mixing the time between men and women uh, taking a, a maternity slash paternity leave. It's really about sharing at certain times that we know might change completely the way women look at a career. So flexibility and also policies beyond education on childcare. So the, lo the logistic part, if you want, to allow women to really make a, a, a choice together with their, their, their partners when they're on their career uh, path, so that we stop seeing when you have 50% in Macedonia and Romania of women at the end of university getting a, a, a science degree, already starting a job, it's down 40%, and then mid-career, it's much less. So that would help definitely. So that one thing uh, to focus on would be this. And then I would like to add that, um, because it was much more than a think tank today, it was what I call a think can do, given all the uh, ideas and, and uh, energies. Um, so we had one researcher in the group, and she said she will exploit directly all the discussions of today in her own research, looking at women in ICT. We had a marketing manager, uh, actually a woman in ICT herself, who personally will develop online, on social media, a lot of discussions around this, and also uh, perhaps build some form of documentary with visual uh, uh, support to actually support these views. We had um, another woman in ICT who, who gave the sort of testimonial that actually I should not be afraid anymore to be a woman in ICT and talk about it. And from, from my part, you know, at the EU level working with EU project, obviously all this will feed uh, very nicely into suggestions we can make at EU level. Thank you, Marie. Thanks also to all presenters, to Eva, to Jana and Sylvia, and to the whole group. And I'm now giving the floor to the third cyber group, or I don't know. Yes, yes to the cyber group. Thank you. Much? Sorry. Yep. So I guess I should be the cyber group, the story goes. <laughs> Right? Obviously, the cybersecurity group was left for the end because that's the kind of topic which inspires exhilaration in audiences. So here we go. So the starting point of our group is that computers are those machines which make faster and more accurate mistakes. However, that's computers at their best. Cybersecurity, on the other hand, is about computers at their worst. Right? And that's exactly what we would like to focus on. I'll be, hopefully enough, very short and sweet on that. And just uh, show you the, 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 I would say, the main, the main insights, the main insights. We started with the basic observation that cybersecurity is getting more important than ever right now. Currently, a DDoS attack, a uh, distributed denial of service, something which can bring your systems, your website, your e-services down, costs about less than $40,000 per hour. So if they continue between 6 and 24 hours, that means that you're good to go with less than half a million, right? Which is not much, right? Which is not much. Better still, you can order that via the dark web, right? So if you have a tour, you just go in there, you order your DDoS, and then you're pretty much good to go and almost untraceable, right? So law enforcement in terms of cybersecurity is quite challenging. Conclusion. So we must do our homework when we design our systems, when we operate them, when we protect them, and if disaster strikes, to have emergency response, to have recovery, to have business continuity, right? So in terms of information security, you might be aware there are two big things. We have system vulnerabilities, that is what is wrong with our systems, and we have information security threats. That's bad things that can happen. And when those combine, we have an information security incident. The goal of our group was to say, hey, what can we do to reduce the exposure, reduce the duration, and reduce the cost of such uh, information security incidents, given our Balkan context? So first thing we did was to focus, OK, what are the major risks that we face here? What are the major, major vulnerabilities? And then a fruitful, enlightening, and to be perfectly honest, very fun discussion took place. 
And we said, well, there are about five things we should be really, really very careful about. First thing, human errors. Number one cause of information security incidents. Might it be human errors in the design, in the operation, or human errors in terms of social engineering, right? When you actually give your password to somebody you shouldn't give it to, right? They are the leading cause for information security breaches. Second thing, zero-day exploits. Some vulnerabilities in your systems, in your software, in your implementation, bad guys knew about before you, right? So they exploit that for the first time. That would be a zero-day exploit. The third major risk is bad security practice. Uh, people don't follow procedure, or they follow a bad procedure. Fourth one would be the so-called APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats, when you have a very well-resourced, very determined attacker. Sometimes, as you know, this might be a state-level actor, right? determined to change something through the change or modification of data or information systems. And finally, lack of security awareness. A lot of people say, well, that's not an important password, for example. I don't need to change it. By the way, in the Bulgarian Ministry of Interior, we had this amazing event uh, where there is uh, this password to a huge uh, database of uh, personal information, right? And then, the, by the way, it was a woman in, in, in security who was administering that, right? And she was not very security aware, so there was uh, a note of the password to this thing on her desktop, right? And on further examination, it turns that uh, she didn't really need that, right? Because this password hasn't been changed since 1995, <coughs> right? So it's a pretty old one. Combining all this, <coughs> right, is a huge threat, right? <coughs> and saying, okay, now that we know that those are the major risks, how can we go and approach those? And again, we had a lot of discussion, right? And again, it was insightful, fun, and I would say very enlightening, and we formulated about 14 policy options, like 14 policy proposals, and we divided them um, st in a structured way into the timeline. We had the short-term measures, something we can just go ahead and implement from tomorrow on. We had medium-term measures, something which can take a bit more time, but not too much. And we had the long-term measures, our, our brave vision of how information security should develop over the next three to five years. So I'll just very briefly go through those, because you know I, I realize I'm in the unfavorable position of staying between uh, an exciting discussion uh, before me and an exciting dinner after me. So there's, there is this sort of, you know, a very untenable position I find myself in. So I'll be very brief on that. If you have questions, obviously I'll be more than happy to answer. So in the short term, uh, we think that four major four major points might be worth considering in the Balkan cybersecurity context. First thing, implement mandatory checklists for network and information security. And I would say even very basic stuff here would be helpful. Update your drivers, monitor ports through which you know that known threats can, come in, uh, can, can possibly come in, change your passwords, use strong passwords, use encryption whenever possible. Really very, very, very basic, very simple steps that you can just go right ahead and then improve dramatically the level of your cybersecurity. Two, update the third information, the computer emergency response team's information on a daily basis to actually provide accurate and up-to-date results of what are the threats, what are the first-day exploits, because yesterday they were zero-day, Today they are known, so they should, should be distributed. A short desk research within our group showed that the Bulgarian CERT right, had last updated their information beginning of February. Right? It's now beginning, it's now approaching mid-March. It's approaching mid-March. In the field of cybersecurity, that's a whole eternity, right? It's, it's a lot of time. Three, introduce post-mortem guidelines. After the accident has happened, to have a clear guideline on how to do your digital forensics, how to do log analytics, what to look for, and how to really have this sort of lessons learned introduced into an evolutionary cycle of learning. And fourth, map cybersecurity companies in the region to ensure flexibility uh, and the ability to exchange product information. And funnily enough, in the Balkan region, that was a huge demand, because a lot of people say, well, we actually produce software here in Bulgaria, we use it across the region, for example, in Romania, in Greece, in Serbia, and then 
people from those countries said, but, but we had no idea, right? So this whole idea of what is the cybersecurity production landscape on the Balkans might be very, very useful. Then moving on to the medium term, probably the most, most, the single most important thing would be to raise awareness about cybersecurity. And this, that would be through public campaigns, through educational initiatives, participation in information security events, in hackathons, etc., etc. This sort of blanket recommendation, which we have for pretty much everything that we would like to move forward, right? But this recommendation, I, I dare say, is a cliche for a reason, right? Awareness is unfortunately rather lacking as of now. And by the way, we should, I guess we should commend the state government agency in Bulgaria. They're doing currently a campaign on cyber hygiene. Really the very basic stuff, change your password, update your software, that sort of very basic but useful stuff. The sixth one would be to introduce mandatory or recommended system requirements. That is, to get to the early stages of either software lifecycle development or procurement, if your organization is procuring, and have very specific requirements for security architecture. For example, while uh, me and the team were working on the government in Bulgaria, uh, we had a mandatory requirement that no system can be entered into production before a successful pen test, penetration testing is made on that system, right? Like a really basic requirement, but every system should go through that. It should have secure authentication, it should have if there are personal data, the possibility to encrypt that. It should have an administrative panel in which we can actually follow what's going on in the system together with secure logging, right? So really basic stuff. Uh, seven, consider expanding more resources. That's the we need more cash uh, recommendation, and that's quite clear, <laughs> so I'm really not going to uh, elaborate painfully on that. So point eight would be to stimulate networks of cooperation between public institutions and private companies. Unfortunately, in the region, we're beginning to see that uh, the ties between the public and the private sector in the field of information security, like in, any, in many other fields, are not as strong as they should be. Let's work on that a bit more. So the ninth one would be to improve data protection. Uh, data protection building is, I would say, a brilliant uh, formulation there. To focus on GDPR capabilities by providing publicly available data protection resources. So as you know, from May 2018, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, will be fully applicable. And it has uh, a heightened standard for how we process, how we store, and how we dispose of personal data, right? As of now, it's quite unclear what a good practice is. I mean, if you decide to do a pseudonymization of data, how would that look like for this specific type of data? If you would like to do encryption, what sort of encryption is okay? Is SHA-1 okay? No, it isn't. Is SHA-256 okay? Yes, it is. Is MD5 okay? Yeah, that's feasible. So this sort of really practical, really hands-on experience on how to apply the lofty principles of the GDPR. Uh, then, of course, capacities building and education for all actors and, of course, civil servants. Across all the countries in the Balkans, all the participants said, well, the people in the administration who are responsible for providing these services are unfortunately not as skilled and as confident, as comfortable with IT as they should be. <coughs> Obviously, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. And uh, point 11, to have a really a very gradual evolutionary approach towards more cooperation at the Balkan level. Initially, the topic of our discussion group was, well, let's have a pan-Balkan third, right? A commuter emergency response team that is to serve every country at the same time and be this sort of nexus of cooperation. However, the big bank approach here might not be as useful. The working group said, we might actually want to move in a more gradual direction. First, to foster cooperation between existing certs, for example, academic certs, which seems to be in existence, for example, in Serbia, and government certs, which are in existence in Serbia, in Bulgaria, in Romania, and are currently being developed in Macedonia. And now that we have this sort of cooperation, data aggregation, established communication links, only then to move on to a single unified structure at the Balkan level, and obviously to be very careful not to overlap with NATO mandate, because currently there is a lot of capacity building in terms of cybersecurity uh, within the NATO framework. So the long term, three quick things. Uh, first, to implement legal changes, defining a better legal basis for cybercrime, including in international context this sort of particular challenge. What is cybercrime? How do you evaluate the damage done? 
right? And how do you persecute that across borders? Uh, Thirteen, we have considered employing volunteer for IT security. And that was really the, the, the US model, where they try to uh, they try to, to really allure top talent to work on government projects on a limited time fixed contracts. That's also the British experience with the government digital service, but we try to get a combination between volunteers and fixed contract talents in order to work on government security or public security or even private sector security projects. Obviously, on simple projects like a municipality website, those can be students, right? Obviously, on complex projects like the national e-identification e schemes, those cannot be students, right? So there is this sort of subtle distinction of who does what when. And finally, uh, to really stimulate the development of private networks or institutes for cooperation in the, field, uh, in the field of information and cyber security. And to actually have a concrete business idea within the group, to have a private peer-to-peer -peer authentication network within, different, within which different stakeholders can, uh, can appreciate and evaluate services according to their level of security. And this ranking could give users a definitive idea of what technological peers think of this service. So really, it's a, a cooperation thing, but it's a private sector-driven cooperation thing. And so with this conclusion, we said um, those are actually uh, 14 pretty nifty recommendations. Some of them can be moved along the lines of private-only interactions. Some of them have to be public-private partnerships. Some of them would have to be public-only interactions. The bottom line is that we really need to be very careful with cybersecurity because up to now, your uh, computer, your smartphone, your watch was sabotaging the election cycle in Kazakhstan because they were participating in a DDoS attack. Soon it will be your fridge, it will be your shoes, and it will be your bracelets that actually sabotage democracy across the world. So I think the time is now to actually take very straight, very simple, but very useful actions. And so that would be my presentation. Thank you all for that. innovative businesses uh, to be uh, really uh, stimulated and created and supported as uh, uh, energy within our region. Uh, I hope you share my, uh, um, my understanding that uh, there are also lots of synergies and leverages uh, between the uh, three topics that uh, we may consider uh, reading again and seeing uh, what we can do as a common network, to which extent they, they are uh, similar patterns that we can uh, follow, uh, where there is a need of specific uh, uh, dynamics uh, in the cooperation communication. And, um, yeah, I think we had a very productive and uh, meeting that generated lots of good ideas uh, and uh, lots of follow-up uh, work. And uh, in accordance to make out of this uh, agenda uh, um, a really a uh, roadmap for development of the innovative economy in the region, uh, we need to commit uh, every one of us and uh, also other people that are not in this room uh, to support and uh, to contribute and to find uh, very clear um, mechanisms that this is sustainable. So this will be the next step. But uh, having said that, I really uh, think that uh, today we uh, set a concrete uh, agenda that uh, is our collective uh, 
result of our collective intelligence and contribution and uh, uh, I want to thank on behalf of the initiators, uh, the Pan Balkan uh, group that a few months ago uh, started, uh, kick-started this initiative, uh, to that uh, you all spent uh, the day today. We will uh, summarize, and this is still a follow-up action to the, uh, to the uh, moderators and reporters of the group. Uh, we will summarize a document that will be distributed. We'll put together a channel. Um, there are uh, still debates uh, which is more, most effective of it, where we can collaborate on different topics. And um, uh, through this uh, online uh, communication platform that will continue our uh, physical meeting today, uh, we will develop uh, in a practical terms uh, some and hopefully all of the ideas that we've uh, uh, exchanged today. Uh, with this, um, the, those are my closing uh, remarks. I want to invite all of you, men and women, to the uh, She Leader at Digital Conference. That is exactly in a month uh, from now. The registration uh, started uh, two days ago, even before, but uh, officially, publicly. Uh, look at on the on the website. Uh, we expect within this group uh, events in the. Uh, in the region to be shared so that they are made available to participants here, but also to the communities and networks uh, within our specific countries that might be interested in participating uh, uh, further, because uh, whatever we have on, on the plan makes sense only if uh, uh, human effort is uh, behind it. Uh, so this is from my side. I don't know if uh, somebody want to share a uh, couple of uh, uh, sentences from the Pan Balkan uh, team or from anybody who participated today. If not, uh, thank you for uh, really uh, participating today. Special thank to the moderators uh, who prepared, uh, to the reporters who introduced in a convincing way. Uh, also uh, to uh, special thanks to the team who uh, prepared uh, this initiative, the, uh, the team of MoveBG that uh, uh, really uh, coordinated the event here uh, to Tsveti, who was uh, in communication with uh, every one of you in the last couple of months, uh, to our uh, guests that uh, flew uh, here to be part of this session. So we continue the dialogue online. <laughs>